What is up everybody, CB here, and today I have another tips video for you guys, and this one is gonna be focusing on franchise and how to set up your team for the best success when playing franchise. This also can help with player development and overall fun in franchise mode. So I hope you guys enjoy, I hope this helps somebody out, and you know, if you know this stuff already, that's good for you, man, that's awesome. But what I have picked up on since I started doing a couple of these videos is that there are some things that I assumed everybody knew. And that was wrong of me to do because not everybody plays the game as much as I do or cares to play it as much as I do, but they still want to enjoy the game. So I'm hoping to be able to sort of bridge that gap between the people who are dedicated and know everything and the guys who are maybe just trying to have some fun, but want to know a little bit more in the process without putting in the legwork. Well, here's your legwork. So, Today we're going to be talking about quite a few different things, so it might be a little bit lengthy, but I'll make sure there's chapters so you guys can go right to the spot that you are worried about and you want some more information on. Today we'll be covering playbooks and schemes, game planning, weekly strategy, the uh, goals for your team, even stuff like depth chart, formation subs, auto subs, the whole nine I'm going to be covering in today's video. And I hope that this can help you guys have a little bit more fun and enjoy Madden in its current state just a little bit more. Some of this stuff is only going to apply to people who actually watch the game like I do, which is CPU versus CPU, super sim in slow motion or in slow speed. Some of this is also for people who just sim and they don't watch a game at all. They just sim, record the stats, rebuild the team and just keep simming. That That's good for you too. So for the guys who really play this game, this could help you if you just are looking for a little bit more immersion, but it also could help you in development for your players. So not just for the guys who play the way I do. First and foremost, we're gonna start on the schemes page. And this to me is the most important thing to pay attention to, especially if you are playing CPU versus CPU or you are simming your franchise, because this is going to directly affect how your team plays and how your players individually look within your game plan and your stats. The first thing you really need to do is you really need to narrow down which scheme you want to run while also making sure that it fits your team. You can see here that the West Coast zone run fits the Vikings very well. It does not fit the quarterback well, which is something that I'm going to touch on because that is an important factor in my in my opinion. But overall, the most of the offense is set to go. Same with this base four, or base three four. You can see that everything except literally one position is a scheme fit, which is awesome. That means we're gonna get the best benefit from our defense and they're gonna play within their talents and also play good as a unit. And that's what we're aiming for, right? I mean, yeah, we can have a whole bunch of great players, but if you don't have a good team, you're not gonna win a lot of games because stats don't equal wins. Sometimes they do, but you guys know what I mean. Once you have decided on a scheme and know that it works with your team is you're gonna wanna match that up with a playbook. Now, one thing that right away jumps out at you is this. This is a West Coast zone run scheme, but the playbook is a West Coast power run. Now you can go back here and go to West Coast power run. You can see that there is still a very, very good scheme fit here, but we're still missing the quarterback. And the quarterback, like I mentioned before, this is, this is one of the most important parts of picking your scheme. And this is where it's gonna get tricky. Not every high percentage scheme is going to work best for your team, even though you would think it would. You need to have certain positions that match up. And from, in my opinion, I believe that while the quarterback is sort of, it is somewhat fluid, sometimes it will give you a hard time. I can change this from a West Coast power run to a vertical zone run and a multiple zone run where you see the archetype on the quarterback change every time, improviser, strong arm, and field general. And I can get three different looking Kirk Cousins. Seriously, and also see three different offensive game plans. And that is the beauty of a scheme. You can change this. You can find books that might work with multiple schemes. So this is sort of the starting point and the foundation of how your team is gonna play. And it's very important to make sure that you pay attention and that you do some due diligence. You know, I do a lot of testing, especially for the Texans franchise and my Vikings one last year. I was constantly testing to see if there's a better playbook for me, a better scheme something to give me that better play from my players. A big component to look for as well is the descriptions you see on these things. You can look under the West Coast zone run. You can see what that description says. Designed to utilize short passing to keep possession of the ball in the run game, offensive linemen use quickness and combination blocks to spring halfbacks through gaps. So this is more of like a zone approach 
you know, a one cut type of takeoff for the running back. And you're going to try and dink and dunk your way down the field. Now, of course, there are still some deep routes in there, but you're not going to see them as often as you would in a vertical zone run. This one is more about trying to take the top off the defense and using the halfbacks to keep the defense honest and give you those opportunities over the top. And then you can even see here where the multiple zone run is actually sort of more built for confusion, where you will find yourself throwing out of an eye formation and running out of a four receiver set. Now, all of this stuff can work well or very bad depending on, on your team. So that's why it is important to test. You might see a book that works well with a multiple zone run, but the play selection doesn't work well with your team. So you might need a different scheme for that playbook, or you might just need a whole different playbook. It's all individual based. It's varying depending on your team. But the two biggest components that I've always noticed is your quarterback and your offensive line. Your offensive line is obviously the most important position, an important group, I should say, to ensure that your quarterback can even show you if he's good or not. So you wanna make sure you're in a scheme that's gonna benefit your linemen. Like here with the multiple zone, you can see that we have a lot of agile linemen. We have a lot of guys with zone type of tendencies and archetypes. But you can also see that the West Coast Power Run, we have a lot of good power too. And this is why if you guys watch my franchise series, if you don't, make sure you check out in the description below. I'll have a link to my playlist for the franchise that I'm currently doing. But if you, if you watch me before, you know that I'm always trying to make sure power and agile are almost identical in the alignment for the linemen and I'm, I'm always upgrading one or the other, you know, to try to keep them even. And this is why it opens up so much more for your playbooks and it's a vital piece to keeping your team playing well. When it comes to choosing your playbooks and your scheme, do not try and force a book and a scheme onto a team just because you like it. Nine out of 10 times, it is always gonna end up in a horrible match and you're gonna be disappointed in it. You have to find something that works for the team that's in front of you. Now you could of course can build your team to fit the book you eventually want them to run, but that takes patience and it takes time. So just remember that. Another thing too, when choosing your playbook is do not be afraid to go away from the norm, right? You can go on these YouTube channels, you can see people saying, oh, the certain gun bun shot of the Cleveland book is always beating cover three and yada, yada, yada. All that stuff, none of that matters when it comes to this kind of stuff here, man. You're not taking advantage of the CPU with this kind of play. But some of the books that you would never touch your, on your own might end up being the best book for your team. I found a lot of success with books that I never would have thought much of because of how I assumed they would be because of the team they were for, like the Houston Texans book, or even you know the, the Raiders playbook a couple of years ago. Just because the team might not have success does not mean there is not a golden set of plays that is going to work for your team in there. So don't be afraid to go out of that comfort zone. You don't need the number one team's playbook to have success. You might find more success in, you know, the, the, the Browns playbook more so than you would the Chiefs playbook. So keep that in mind when you're choosing your team here. And then one last thing that we are that I wanted to show you guys is in the description of these playbooks, it tells you a lot about them. Just because it says it's a West Coast zone run does not mean that it's gonna run the same as every other West Coast zone run. Looking at Atlanta's playbook here, it says, the goal of this playbook is to frequently run the ball while throwing to the intermediate level of the field. Now here at the Jets playbook, same thing, West Coast zone run, but the goal of this one, still wear down defenses by running, but passing short and medium with frequent play action usage. You didn't even see play action get used at all in Atlanta's description. So some of those little nuances will actually change the entire format of how that playbook is called in CPU versus CPU. So a very important thing to pay attention to just because not all West Coast zone run, West Coast power run are all built the same as the other ones. You got to read, you got to look and you got to study. And then you, of course, you have to test on your own to decide what's going to work best for you. Okay. Once you have these schemes down and you have your playbook selected, there's a few more things that play into your weekly play calling. And now this is not something that you can just set up and leave alone. This is something you have to do every week. And that is your weekly strategy. I'm going to take you through my weekly strategy here. If I was playing the Packers and just so you guys get an idea of how I look at it and maybe you guys can pick up on some stuff. So looking here first, I know from my experience as of running the Packers book last year, and also just my knowledge of playing other people who have used the Packers playbook in CPU versus CPU, it says that the pass is more frequent, but I do know that if they're not throwing it, you know, intermediate to deep, they do a lot of inside running. 
and Aaron Jones can tear you up if you are not ready for it. So because of that, I am going to go ahead and I'm going to choose inside run. I would not recommend always choosing what the game tells you to choose because I don't think the game actually does any homework. There are plenty of teams that have outside run as their main tendency. The Packers are not one of them, which is why I like the book myself. I don't like the outside runs. They don't work very well in Madden. Also, don't pay attention to the stats on the top threat line because half the time they don't tell you anything and it, it always is just better if you just do it on your own. Defensively, you can see that they zone blitz a lot. The play calling tendencies is probably the only thing I actually pay attention to because there's no way to lie about that. That's that's what the book kind of runs. That is what it's built to run. It's, it's built on zone coverage and zone blitzing. So I'm going to be putting blitz counter on to try and give Kirk Cousins a little bit more time in the pocket and allow my line a little extra help in blocker blitz awareness and also my receivers off of double moves to get there better. And I know I'm not going to try to short, short pass it because that's not what my playbook is going to call for. So that's sort of the mindset I'm going to have with this. But you can, of course, choose all sorts of different ones. Just be very careful on which ones you choose because it is going to affect how your game plays. If you say throw it, throw it medium or throw it short or blitz counter, it will affect the calls that you get in the game, like the play calling. I've seen it. Like I knew the last year, I always knew that if I chose blitz counter when I was in the art, when I was playing like game planning for the RFL, which if you guys don't know what the RFL is, go check out my featured channels. It's linked there. It's an awesome place. It's a great league. But what I learned there last year is if I called blitz counter with my playbook, I got a better mixture of passing and running than I did if I even did run inside. No lie. I don't know why it does that, but it does. So this is another thing where you might have to test a little bit more to find the one that you like best. And then one thing that's very important, but I don't think a lot of people understand is this weekly game plan goal. So this weekly game plan, you are essentially giving instructions to your team as to what you want to try and accomplish this week. So if you select allow two or less passing touchdowns, you might call more, you know, more cover three or more press man or something to try and lessen how many th uh, passing touchdowns they can get. If you choose sack the quarterback five times, your defense might end up being a little bit more aggressive up front, maybe a couple more blitzes than normal. You know, so this can actually also affect what plays are called in your game plan. So you want to really pay attention to them and you want to make sure you pick good ones. And you don't want to pick ones that are outrageous because your players can be effective negatively just like they can positively. You can end up losing morale sometimes for players not meeting goals. So be careful when making these decisions and think about what your team is capable of and what you want to try to accomplish depending on the team that you're playing that week. So I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to do... I got... Zadarius Smith and I got Daniel Hunter. We're going to try to sack the quarterback five times. That's not that far out of the question. And I think that we can allow, this is the Packers. So we're going to go allow 24 points or less. They're a very good team. And on offense, we are going to go for 300 passing yards. I think we can hit that easily. And then on the head coach side, I'm going to do win turnover battle. If, if I can win the turnover battle, I feel like we have a good shot of winning this game. And this right here is part of the reason why even player versus CPU or user versus CPU play can be affected by this because some of your bonus XP is going to come from not only your mentor tags, but also your scheme fits in the team. When you have a scheme fitted player, they can get extra XP because they are a scheme fit. So that's always something to pay attention to. If you have players that are out of position, they might not get as much XP as if, you know, they were a scheme fit. So that's another reason to, even if you're not playing CPU versus CPU, to pay attention to your schemes and your playbooks. Your franchise staff is important as well for your development. You have the ability to choose a side for where you want your boosts to come from. So if I chose the left side, I'm gonna end up getting mean streak for my fullbacks. And then down here, it's gonna be run block finesse for my offensive line. Now think about plus three to all of your offensive lines, run blocking finesse. That's actually a pretty good advantage. And then on this side here, it's all about the power. So this is why it's important to match your scheme as well as your franchise staff, because you don't want to go ahead and buy or have a coordinator that has, you know, finesse unblocked, but you're running a power set because now you have linemen that are getting boosted in an area that you're not even going to run much because you run in a finesse playbook. And also you're asking your linemen to do something that they are not comfortable with. You got to think about it like that, right? And you think about a lineman that is known to be just a mauler, right? A big guard. 
You put a guard in the middle of the field, chances are they're going to help your run game out. But if you put them at the left tackle position, they're out of their comfort zone. They're not going to play always as good as they would at the guard position. And you have to look at your schemes the same way. When you're asking guys to be a power team, you need power players, which is why it is important to also pay attention to your staff along with your playbooks and your schemes. Now that more of the, the broad terms are taken care of, now it is more your week to week game planning. This stuff can change depending on the team you're playing, the, the rosters that they have, the individual players that they have, and that is formation subs and auto subs. Now auto subs, I'm not gonna touch too much on because I feel that right now they're a little bit broken, but I will give a brief rundown of what they are if you don't know what they are. So this is telling you at the percentage of their stamina when they are going to come in and go out of the game. So your QB or your halfback sub out here at 60. Once your halfback hits 60% on their on their stamina, they are going to sub out of the game until they can re-enter at 80 or above stamina. Now, in order to create a better rotation, if you will, you can raise this up a little bit and you can raise this up so they get out earlier and you play around with it to see, do you want your backup in a little bit more? Do you want to try to split time more? You, this is a way to do it. Same with your receivers. If you got like six receivers, like I usually do, and you want to see more than just two of them, you can put this at 80, maybe put this at 70. And then as they get tired and sub out, you get a chance to see some of your other players. It's a good way to keep your guys fresh on the field. You want to also want to be careful with this because this, the progressive fatigue does matter here. With the progressive fatigue turned on, you could end up phasing a guy out of the game altogether because maybe towards the end of the year, your halfback is already below 88% of his stamina because of all of the practicing. So if you have it at 88, he might never play in the game at all. Hopefully that gets fixed because it's realistic, but the way the game makes it work, it's not realistic. But again, something to think about. You might have to tweak it as the year goes on. You might have to play around with it to see if it works. Right now, I don't think it's working at all from what I've read. I haven't tested it out too much enough yet to have my own opinion on it, but I've heard that it's not working much at all. So if you try this and it don't, you don't see a difference, it's because Madden. <laughs> That's really the only, that's the only excuse I can have is it's because Madden. Formation subs gives you the ability to change who is in on every formation and where they're lining up. This can be the difference between having a great game plan and having one of your players phase out that you don't want them to be phased out of. This is also a good way to offset your depth chart. If you wish there was more creativity on your depth chart, or maybe there's just a certain player you want running in a certain formation, this is where you set that up. And it's very simple to do. But if I wanna switch out Adam Thielen here, I can go over to 19, and then I can choose any receiver I want, you know, to play here. Now, if maybe I want Justin Jefferson to be over here. Well, what you're gonna to have to do then is, you know, go over to Jeff Justin Jefferson and basically sub him out, and then sub him in for Thielen, and then you can go back and set Thielen here. So now you just, flip-flopped them. This is a way to completely control who you can target in a game. And the way you can do that, if you want to get real serious about this, this is what I do. If you go to huddle.gg, now <laughs> this isn't a sound like a promotion, but it really is not. I am, I am far from receiving promotions or sponsorships from anybody. I think we can all agree on that. I have like 300 subscribers. But if you go to huddle.gg, these guys put in some serious work and not only like coming up with game plans for user play, but they also have an amazing database of every playbook and the play art. So you can see the play art in the game while you're doing this. I do this all the time. So like for instance, last year when I had the Viking series, I went in and I found the formations that had the majority of the red routes. Like if I found a formation where most of the red routes when, when I mean red routes, I mean the primary routes. When you look at the play art, the route is red. That means obviously that is the primary read on that play. So if I wanted just Justin Jefferson and all the red routes, I went and found him. And let's say I found one where in bunch offset, 80% of the red routes went to KJ Osborne. I would just go in here and I would simply put Justin Jefferson in that area. So now I know when I call bunch offset, a majority of the looks are gonna go to my best player. This also works the same for running backs. If you find a formation that maybe has a little bit more inside run, you want more of a power back in there instead of your elusive back, same thing. Just go over to your running back, click on them, change them out for your power back, and now you're set to go. And there's actually a couple of things in the depth chart that I wanna to talk to you guys about now 
that are very important based off of how Madden changed things that also play into how this formation stuff, the formation subs work. So let's go over there now. Here we are in the good old depth chart. So most of you guys know exactly what the depth chart is. And you might be thinking, well, why, what? You're not gonna show me anything about this depth chart that I don't already know. Chances are, you're probably right. But I feel like there's a couple of things that guys don't realize or maybe overthink that I have picked up on because I primarily play this way in competitive mode, like in a league that is, you know, streamed and everything. And I also do it for my channel here. And two very important things are wide receivers and cornerbacks. Now I mentioned in the formation subs that I would always move Jefferson to the red routes. And you might be thinking, well, he's the number one receiver. He's obviously going to get looked at the most. Not Madden world. In Madden's world, they never actually swapped where the red routes go. Of course, not every play is destined to go to the number one. But if you remember about four or five years ago, Madden actually had the number one wide receiver lining up on the right side of the formation. So just picture a play, he would always be to your right instead of your left. Now all the wide receiver ones are lined up on the left for the most part. Obviously, different formations can change that, but primarily they are lined up on the left side. When Madden did this, the playbooks never really changed. So there are still quite a bit of playbooks that have a majority of the red routes going to the right side of the formation, which is where your number two is playing, which is also why you see Justin Jefferson here listed as number two receiver. And if you notice this in your game or when you're playing that, you know, why is my number two always getting the targets or why is my number three always getting the targets? but My number one is left with no catches. This might be why. Of course, it also could be coverage, but this also could just be simply the game plan is calling a lot of plays where the red routes are not in their direction. And what I'll do is I'll swap these players out so that they are in their direction. Sometimes there's more plays called for Thielen than there is Jefferson in this playbook. So I will put Jefferson at two so he gets the majority of the looks like I expect him to. Now, if I don't like that control, that's when I go to the formation subs. But there's one thing that I don't touch in formation subs because it gets a little messy and I don't recommend you do it. But I do in the play in the depth chart all the time because it's important. And that is your cornerbacks. And you see, I do the same exact thing here as I do for my wide receivers. The reason I do this is while all of the receivers line up on the left side that are listed as the number one receiver, Madden never swapped that out for the corners. So the corners, if they're the number one, always line up on the right side of the formation. They line up over the number two receiver. I don't know why this was never changed, but it wasn't. So the number two corner is always playing on the left side where the number one corner is. So if you swap these two guys around, now, on the majority of the formations, because obviously the CPU is not going to be doing formation subs like I am or like you are, they're going to have their number one most of the time on the left side of the formation because that's what how the game is coded. And you want your number one corner over there. So if you put him at number two, he's now going to line up on that side of the field instead of on the right side where the number two is or the number three is and essentially just give them a better shot at making a big play with their number one receiver. So this is another big tip that I, I recommend if you're especially playing CPU for CPU, even if you're playing user, you don't have to worry about them being lined up over bad, you know, over another player. The last tip I have for, for depth charts is in the specialty things here. Now, this is something that I feel a lot of people already know. So I'm going to go ahead and just explain it anyway. 3DRB does not just mean third down back. This pretty much means anytime that there's an elusive style play called that calls for the elusive running back, this is the guy that's going to be called into the game. Not your starting running back, not your power back, this guy. So if you've ever noticed where you have maybe, you know, you wanted to make Ty Chandler your third down back to get him some extra looks, but then you're wondering why is Chandler always in the game? Even though Dalvin Cook is the starting running back on my team. It's because a lot of the plays or a lot of the formations play off of these two settings more than they do the actual starter. So the third down back is essentially your starting elusive back, which means that in about 80% of shotgun formations, this is the guy that's going to be in the game, not your starting running back. Same with power back. Based off of your goal line, some of your, your eye formations, this is the guy that's gonna be lined up no matter who the starting running back is in the normal halfback area of your depth chart. Same with the slot receiver here. You see we have KJ Osborne and Jalen Naylor as the one and two. 
So if there is ever a call for four receivers, two of them being in the slot, it's gonna be Osborne and Naylor. But if you look at the regular wide receiver screen, you see that actually it's supposed to be Jalen Rager that is the number four, but it will not work that way. It is going to pull Osborne and Naylor because in the slot receiver, that is what they are set up to be. This overpowers your regular depth chart spot. Same with this here. Your front seven depth chart is only for your base plays, your three, four, and your four, three sets. If you are running nickel, like almost everybody is about 90% of the time nowadays, your entire depth chart is right here in the RLE, the REE, the RDT, and then the sub linebacker. And what that means, of course, is rushing left end, right end, rushing defensive tackle, and sub package linebacker, and your slot corner. So when you are setting this up, you have to make sure that you have your pass rusher set up as your four down lineman in the rushing area because otherwise, every time you play nickel, it's going to pull somebody else. So that's why I have Hunter here. He's obviously the, one of the edge rushers, but in a 3-4, you stand up. In a 4-3, your, your hand's in the dirt. And in a nickel package, you got four down linemen. So Hunter is down here. Smith is down here. And you can see that a guy like Harrison Phillips, who's normally my end in my base set, is going to slide in because he's actually a defensive tackle in a four down set. And that is that's why this is very, very important. And the same goes for the sub linebackers. When you go to nickel set, it's not taking your best two overall linebackers. It's going to take whoever's listed here at one and two. And of course, if it's a dime set, you only have one court, uh, one linebacker, then it's going to take your top guy here in Kendricks. So this is a very important part. You cannot skip over doing this. This is probably more important than your actual normal depth chart, to be honest with you guys. And then here in the slot corner, same thing applies as the slot receiver. It does not matter what the three, four, and five are in your normal cornerback depth chart. The one is going to be your nickel corner. The two is going to be your dime corner every single time. So if I have Patrick Peterson listed here as the slot corner, anytime we call a nickel package, he is gonna get pulled from the outside and play inside automatically. And that is going to cause guys like Booth and Dantzler to now go up to be the outside corners while Peterson mans that slot position. So you have to be careful with that stuff. It's always going to override your base depth chart. So guys, that is really all I had for you. I know some of this stuff might have been very common sense for you guys, but I know there is plenty of people out here who are maybe just getting started in this game or maybe haven't been around it enough or deep dived it enough to understand this stuff. And I'm just really hoping to be able to help more people out. Back when I was trying to find more stuff out about this game, I could never find videos like this, man. I could find everything I needed to about a mutt card or you know, the, the cheese plays to beat cover three, but I couldn't find this kind of stuff. And I feel like this kind of stuff is very important too. So I wanted to make sure that there is somebody out here giving you guys some content like this. Maybe I just suck at searching for videos on YouTube, but you know, now we have another one here. If you guys do like these videos that I'm doing, I have created a playlist of just my tip videos and I put that in the description below. So that way, anytime you guys need to see anything that I've talked about, you can just go straight to that playlist and you'll see every video I've ever done about how to do this stuff in this game. So you don't have to dig through all of the franchise videos that I have out there. Cause I know I do a lot more of those than I do with these. If you're new here and you like what you saw, please consider subscribing and liking that video. Turn that bell notification on so you know when I upload another one of these. And if you also like franchise, you might want to stick around cause I do a very long-term rebuild with a team every year. Right now it's the Texans where only I think I think uh, episode six just came out. So just starting off there, but hey, that's all I got for you guys. I appreciate you guys so much for watching. I'll see you guys next time.